Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, sending help to Ontario's front lines. The premiers right across the country are obviously concerned about what's happening in Ontario. After a war of words between governments, the promise of help as Ontario's doctors brace for what's next. We added 20 ICU beds last week and uh, they're all full. Also tonight, the heightened risk of contracting a serious case of COVID for pregnant women. It's a disease of anybody. The calls to push them to the front of the vaccination line. Plus, a family goes public after an air conditioning contract turns into something else. There are tens of thousands of Canadians who have no idea that the equity in their home is under attack. And port -a -Pic, Nova Scotia, one year later. Everyone's connected to it. Most people know someone who was affected. The demand for answers. This is The National. Much of this country is dealing with COVID-19's deadly third wave, but while some provinces watch the rising waters with worry, doctors in Ontario say their intensive care system is in danger of drowning. Case rates are still at their highest ever levels, the number of variants surging, hospitalizations climbing to record heights. At this rate, every ICU bed in the province could be full in less than two weeks. But into this chaotic storm come lifelines as Ottawa and other provinces jump in to help. It comes after weeks of tension between Ontario and Ottawa over vaccine supply. But at a news conference this afternoon, the federal government said it was marshalling aid to send to Canada's biggest province. Here's Ashley Burke on what we know so far. It was almost a year ago that Ontario was forced to lean on the federal government, and it's about to happen again. But this time, it's more than the military. The premiers right across the country are obviously concerned about what's happening in Ontario, and the conversations have been along the lines of what can we do collectively to help. The Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and the Prime Minister, both on the phones with premiers this weekend, finding ways for smaller provinces and territories to help Canada's biggest province struggling with surging cases. We'd love to be able to provide some uh, personnel in that respect, uh, some medical expertise. Premier Andrew Fury, a doctor, has traveled with healthcare teams to Haiti and other countries in need. Now his province is sending help to Ontario too, including his wife, also a doctor. It allows for some relief for the people who are working, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop. The federal government is offering to coordinate, transport and cover the costs transporting uh, medical health professionals uh, around the country. We're putting everything on the table to keep you safe. Also on the table, sending federal health care workers, boosting rapid testing in hotspots and military medical teams. All of this after the political rhetoric escalated Friday, when Premier Doug Ford started pointing fingers at the federal government. Would we be in this position if we were getting 300,000 vaccines back in February, like the rest of the world? The answer is absolutely not. Vaccine shipments surpassed initial delivery schedules by over 50% for the first part of the year. Earlier today, Doug Ford's office said that the premier was getting in touch with European consulates to try and secure additional doses of the vaccine for Ontario. But after the federal government's press conference today, Christine Elliott, the Ontario Health Minister's office, got in touch with a different message, saying that they are grateful for the federal government's support. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Perhaps the only bright spot in Ontario today is that for the first time in weeks, daily new cases have declined a bit. It's too soon to know if this will become a trend, but for hospitals, the outlook for the coming days remains grim. Hospitalizations lag new infections by days or weeks. The boom in daily new cases began in early March. The echo of ICU admissions began towards the end of the month, surging to 741 patients today. The province has said that hospitals might be able to handle up to 1,000 patients before resorting to triage. Recent governing, government modelling suggests the province could reach that before the end of the month. Tally Ricci spoke to doctors who face that reality behind those numbers every day and who feel the province's current restrictions still leave the most vulnerable at risk. 
As healthcare workers, we're exhausted. The chief of emergency medicine at Hamilton Health Sciences says he wishes the public could see inside of his ICU and how they simply can't keep up. We added 20 uh, ICU beds last uh, week and uh, they are all full. What the public can see is the mobile health unit getting set up on site to handle the rising number of COVID-19 patients. It will house 80 hospital beds. If we don't get a handle on this in the next coming weeks, uh, the projections are, are expected to be uh, beyond our, our uh, current capabilities. Today, long lineups showed there was no shortage of people who wanted their first dose at a vaccine pop-up in a Toronto hotspot. Reba Mai brought her parents. Both are essential workers. Well, my dad works at a factory um, and my mom, she works at a food processing plant. I've been looking forward to this for so long. So when they announced this, like the pop-up site, I was really, really excited. There is growing anger from medical professionals who say the latest restrictions don't target essential workers. Most construction sites and factories remain open. Measures like paid sick leave and reconsidering what is essential altogether were what many doctors were hoping to hear from the province. Certain essential, um, you know, company, companies have been deemed essential when they're not truly essential and are at high risk of risking spread between employees and their families. The same group of people that is mostly affected, frontline workers, essential workers, uh, people who cannot afford to work from home, socially distanced, multi-generational homes, marginalized, racialized neighborhoods. And the vaccine rollout can't stop what hospitals could face in the coming weeks. We'll have to make some ethical decisions that um, that we could prevent. His fear of having to make life or death decisions is inching closer to reality. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. And we'll take a deeper look at how doctors are preparing to make those choices about who gets treatment later in the hour. Terence McKenna on what we know about the protocol drawn up to guide Ontario doctors. The restrictions that were announced in Ontario Friday prompted angry reactions from doctors across the province, including the government's own advisors. Peter Uni, a medical doctor and the scientific director for the province's COVID-19 science table, says he almost stepped down after they were announced, but he stayed on at the urging of colleagues. And he shared his frustration on CBC Radio yesterday. Yeah, I feel terrible. I had, a, you know, a, a crying fit when I was uh, on the call with Danny Brown. He actually tried to com comfort me. It's, uh, it's just wrong, you know. It's just wrong. And we're joined now by Dr. Uni. You, you heard how emotional you were, even just talking about the restrictions released on Friday. But after that interview, the province modified some of those restrictions. Uh, so, how does that change make you feel today? Well, you know, it's a, it's a first step, but we need to be aware of it's a very small step. Um, with the policing and the restriction of outdoor spaces, the province actually managed to increase inequity even more, and that's not the way to go. They also endangered, you know, the adherence of people to measures in any case. So I'm glad that this was done, but, you know, we still haven't tackled the main problem here. We need to address the root causes if we want to get this pandemic under control. The root causes are mainly related to essential workers and their families. If the essential workers workers don't get the necessary protection and this means now an efficient paid sick leave paying people to stay home if they're either symptomatic or exposed. If we don't have that part and if we don't make sure that we really have a clear distinction between what is really, really, really essential and what is not, this won't work out. It's very simple. We have just seconds here, but what's your level of confidence that the right things will be done? I wouldn't be able to tell. Um, I mean, I realize that everybody's in a difficult position, but we need to do the right thing now. And everybody needs to, despite, you know, anxieties, confusion, everybody needs to help now, including the provincial government. Dr. Uni, thank you very much for speaking with us. Ontario and Alberta have announced big changes to who can get the AstraZeneca vaccine. Starting Tuesday in both provinces, it will be available to anyone over 40. Health Canada says it's safe for anyone above the age of 18, but the National Advisory Committee on Immunization still recommending it only for those above 55. 
Starting at midnight tonight, Ontario's borders with Manitoba and Quebec will close. It's an attempt to reduce COVID transmission. The Ontario Provincial Police, as well as local police forces, will be setting up checkpoints, including at crossings between Ottawa and Gatineau. There will be exceptions for essential workers, the transportation of goods, medical supplies, as well as an exception for the exercise of treaty rights. While Ontario is Canada's worst COVID-19 hotspot, Aaron Broman shows us there are concerning signs in several provinces prompting a range of responses. This sunshine was too good to pass up. Hundreds crowded Vancouver beaches and parks. We all took pictures and said, gee, maybe we should send these to Dr. Henry. BC has a record number of active cases and hospitalizations, but experts say officials should be slow to crack down on people here. The last thing we want to do is take away these outdoor um, recreation offerings. We're in a race now with these variants and, and vaccinations. Alberta will launch a targeted mass vaccination clinic at the Cargill meat plant this week. The scene last year of Canada's largest outbreak. A lot of the workers face numerous barriers in accessing vaccine and accessing health services um, in general. So they generally tend to be from newcomer backgrounds. Alberta's third wave is now nearing the height of its second. In Saskatchewan, per capita ICU admissions are second only to Ontario's. Victor Thunderchild, a teacher, was among them, but lost his battle with COVID-19 on Saturday. He raised me with everything that he could. He built it up from nothing. You know, he was my best friend, the great, greatest dad ever. Just days before he died, Thunderchild called on the Premier to vaccinate teachers. My dad was a very healthy man, a very, very healthy man, and how COVID really affected him, um, it, you know, it damaged his lungs. In Quebec, ICU admissions have been rising sharply. In Montreal, health officials are scrambling to overcome weak demand for AstraZeneca by going to the streets to target diverse neighborhoods. Are you between 55 and 79 years old and would like to get vaccinated? We have a mobile vaccination clinic. Here in Manitoba, officials have signaled they may introduce new restrictions this week. This weekend, the province posted the highest daily case counts since January. Outside of Atlantic Canada, every province is now focused on slowing down a spiraling third wave. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. As this third wave worsens, there's growing concern over the threat of COVID to a new group of vulnerable people, pregnant women, especially as the number in intensive care climbs to alarming levels. Briar Stewart looks at the push to put them at the front of the vaccination line. Yeah, the baby was moving around. It was the cutest thing. I, I cried a little bit. <laughs> Danica Masisco is due in mid-July and the typical new mom worries have been magnified because of COVID. So I've had to stop working about a month ago because of the high stress of keeping myself safe at work. She doesn't understand why all pregnant women in BC aren't prioritized when it comes to the vaccine. Some are pushing for that to change, saying pregnant women should be at the front of the line, not just here, but across Canada. I would personally love to see pregnant women have uh, access to the vaccine now because of their increased vulnerability. Dr. Deborah Money says the latest research points to pregnant women being five times more likely to be hospitalized because of COVID-19. And in hospitals, physicians are reporting seeing more pregnant women with COVID much sicker. At Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, they currently make up 20% of the patients in the ICU. Now we're seeing young, healthy women who do not have any other pre-existing medical concerns. And so now it's not just a disease of those who are at risk, it's a disease of anybody. Doctors say it's not yet clear whether the variants are affecting pregnant women particularly hard or whether more are ending up in hospital because COVID is spreading so widely among younger people. Research is underway. In the meantime, doctors are urging women to get the vaccine. In Alberta, pregnant women were able to start booking their appointments at the end of March. Especially with rising variant numbers in Alberta, uh, it feels especially good to have had the vaccine. I know that I'll feel a lot safer once I'm vaccinated. But in many other parts of the country, 
Women are still waiting as cases climb, and for many, anxiety runs high. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. CBC News has learned the federal government has received hundreds of complaints about the pandemic aid wage subsidy program. It was designed to help companies avoid layoffs. But as Aaron Salzman reports, there are serious questions about how some big companies use the money. Yellow Pages has been connecting you with local businesses for 100 years. Yellow Pages, the phone book turned digital marketing company. We're all staying home. Shortly after the pandemic hit, it had more cash than net debt. It started paying a dividend, and it bought back more than $3 million worth of its own stock. Yet Yellow Pages also received more than $7 million from the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, or SUES. People have to keep their jobs. SUES pays up to 75% of employees' wages. To qualify, companies only had to show a drop in revenue. There were no restrictions on increasing executive pay, buying back shares, or raising dividends. So, for example, TFI International got $52 million in SUES, then increased its dividend twice. Highliner Foods got $3.4 million, then increased its dividend 40% due to increased cash flow. Tourmaline Oil did the same, so did Alamos Gold, and they were all completely within the rules. SUES was intended to make companies whole, not to make companies uh, more profitable. In fact, CBC News has learned CRA has now received almost 1,200 complaints about all kinds of potential misuses of SUES, but the federal government hasn't assessed any penalties. Some experts say it's because there weren't enough rules to break. The government dropped the ball. It really does make my blood boil. Struggling small businesses like this craft brewery had periods where they didn't qualify for sues because their business is seasonal. The idea that corporations were increasing payouts to shareholders is tough to swallow. It's really heartbreaking. You know what a lot of small business owners are stressing to hell that, you know, how am I going to make it to the end of the week? Back in December, the minister's office told us it would come down hard on companies abusing the money with huge fines. That hasn't happened. And when we asked again, they told us simply that all parties unanimously approve the SUS program to protect jobs. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. An Ontario man is going public, taking on several companies after his elderly mother was locked into a 10-year heating and air conditioning contract and then slapped a $15,000 lien on her property for the equipment. As Rosa Marcatelli shows us, they are not alone. Be careful. When Matt Fuchs needed money to hire a home care worker for his mother with Parkinson's and dementia, he applied for a line of credit based on the equity in her home, but was denied after a $15,000 lien was found on the property. One he and his mother knew nothing about, he says. It was put there after a company called Nationwide Home Comfort locked his mom into a 10-year rental contract for a furnace and air conditioner in a door-to-door -door sale four years ago, says Fuchs. They came in and convinced somebody that has a uh, uh, cognitive issues uh, that they needed something that they didn't need. It was a sense of, of disgust, really. The company then sold the contract to Home Trust. Then that company sold it again to Crown Crest Capital, which collected the monthly payments and put a lien on the property. The Fuchs are now suing all the companies involved. It's a huge issue, and the reason is there are tens of thousands of Canadians across the country who have no idea that the equity in their home is under attack. He says these liens are often put on right away, even before customers default on payments. There are thousands of complaints about these kinds of contracts. Go Public hears them all the time. Some provinces banned these door-to-door -door sales, but that hasn't fixed the problems because it doesn't stop the liens, which are easy money for the companies, says Robinson. Stop that and you'll solve the problem because then they have no incentive. As for the company's nationwide home comfort is no longer operating, but the former director says the Fuchs claims are false. Home Trust didn't reply to requests for comment, and Crown Crest Capital says it regrets the Fuchs chose to sue before reaching out to the company directly, and that the company did not have anything to do with the origination of the contract, which is the subject of the litigation. In court documents, Crown Crest Capital denies all allegations. The other companies haven't filed a response. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Go Public. 
Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. It was one year ago tonight that a gunman began a murder rampage in Nova Scotia. 22 people died in the largest mass shooting in modern Canadian history. Kayla Hounsell now on today's events to remember the victims. The day began with a memorial marathon. Runners wound their way along a quiet country road in Portapique. This runner carried the names of all 22 who lost their lives here on her back. It's going to be a hard one, but there's a lot of us here who I know are doing it to remember the people, so it, it'll be good, and I think it's going to help a lot of people. But they can't run from the pain the past year has produced. Trauma, it shatters your nervous system and has shattered my soul in many, in many ways. Jenny Kierstead's uh, sister, Lisa McCulley, was among those killed. She was such a joyful spirit. She says helping organize today's events in memory of all of the victims has been a welcome distraction. I'm not good with feelings. Her daughter danced through her grief and performed for a memorial service along with Canadian artists like Johnny Reed. There's a place up there for people like you. And Nova Scotia's own Heather Rankin. You're never Prime Minister Justin Trudeau agreed in a video message. You are not alone. All Canadians stand with you and grieve with you. But one year on, there remain many questions about what happened and what the RCMP did to stop it. This large crowd marched to demand answers. Like we can't grieve. How can you grieve if you don't know what happened? Still, others chose to remember in the quiet of a contemplative walk in a park near the marathon finish line. If this is what I can do to help them feel better, I'll do it every year. There is no finish line for grief, but at least for some, this coming together of community is a deep breath after a year spent gasping for it. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Truro, Nova Scotia. And while the country pays tribute to the victims of that devastating weekend, Portapique has had to live in the shadow of tragedy every day since. It seems like your whole premise about people is shaken. Coping with unimaginable loss and working to rebuild. Plus, it is the eve of Budget Day, the first federal budget in two years. Will it help small businesses that continue to bear the brunt of the pandemic? I think after this period, I never want to use the word pivot again. And a familiar news beat upgraded. We'll take the challenge. Welcome back. Finance Minister Christopher Freeland followed tradition today, showing off her new shoes ahead of tomorrow's federal budget. I chose to buy my shoes from a great Canadian woman entrepreneur whose showroom for her company, Svel, is based in my own riding here in Toronto. This budget will be the first in more than two years, and it will have to chart a course for Canada post-pandemic. So what can we expect? Our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, has been working her sources today. And Rosie, what are you hearing? Well, Ian, as you said, this budget really does have to deal, of course, with the crisis that Canada is still facing, but also for what is next. A senior government source tells us that some of the supports that are already in place for Canadians and for businesses are going to continue beyond this summer. So think about the commercial rent program, the wage subsidy program, though they might start to look a little bit different and transition into something different. So they'll go through the summer and into the fall. That's the first piece. The big centerpiece of this budget will be childcare. Women have been disproportionately hit by this pandemic. The government wants to help them get back into the workforce. So there should be something in place as early as 12 to 18 months from, from now. What it looks like, we've heard the government talk about the Quebec model, 10 bucks a day. It will take more than $2 billion to get it off the ground. There'll also be new money for clean tech, for skills training, for small businesses. Overall, anywhere between 70 to $100 billion in spending over the next three years, Ian. Although I'm also told the deficit may not be quite as big as some have expected and certainly won't hit the $400 billion mark. All right, so we have a minority government. Let me ask you, is there any chance that we should be thinking about an election anytime soon? 
You know, there's always a possibility. So I don't want to guarantee anything. But the, remember, the government only needs one other party to survive this. Given the severity of this third wave, it's hard to imagine anyone would want to be responsible for triggering an election right now. That includes the government. But no matter what, this document is one the Liberals are going to have to campaign on and watch for what the opposition parties agree and disagree with, because that'll give you a pretty good idea of what their eventual campaigns will look like uh, as well, Ian. All right, Rosemary, thank you. Thanks, Ian. And Rosie will host our special coverage of the budget tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern on CBC Television, News Network and GEM. Small businesses have been among the most hard hit by the pandemic. So on the eve of budget day, Peter Armstrong went to one street in Toronto to find out what business owners there hope tomorrow brings. You know, you don't need to be an economist to see the damage that's been done to the economy. Just walk down the main street of your town or neighborhood. All of these businesses have been hit and they've been hit hard. And you know, every stat you read, GDP, jobs, trade numbers, they're all just a macro collection of what's going on behind these closed doors. And you know, the thing that strikes me the most in talking with these store owners is their sense of optimism that if we can just get through this period, things are gonna be okay. Hey, Hi. how's it going? This is Jenna Lam. Her kid's store is a mainstay on this street. When the pandemic hit, she pivoted to online sales, brought in more puzzles and games for a nation of parents struggling with the kids at home. I think after this period, I never want to use the word pivot again. This month, the government allowed her to reopen in-store shopping, only to shut it down again as COVID cases rose. I think this time, it's we received the shortest notice. More than anything, she just wants better communication from the government. There has to be some sort of a warning or information to give us and everybody, families, uh, families that have children in school, us businesses, some sort of a heads up so that we can be in preparation. She's weathered wave after wave of shutdowns and reopenings and partial closures. And yet, even now, she's still hopeful. Optimism is all we have left. All these businesses have been forced through an impossible year. Millions of their employees lost their jobs. But remember, millions more simply shifted to working from home. They couldn't go anywhere, and so they couldn't spend any money. All told, Canadian households saved about $100 billion. And economists say once these restrictions are lifted, all that money is set to flow back in to these businesses. So Jean-Francois, how important is all that excess cash? That money sitting in bank accounts, the, the you know this pent up demand for a range of services and, and goods that we haven't been able to purchase, um, just you know really kicks into higher gear. Perot says small businesses need assurances that the government will continue to be there to support them through the immediate crisis and along that road back to normality. I think the the most important thing they can do is is signal policy continuity that you know they've been attuned to the needs of small business they will remain attuned to the needs of small business they're not going to pull um, effective programs away too early after spending an entire year cooped up inside people want to do stuff again not just buy stuff so whenever this latest round of restrictions finally does subside the businesses that cater in experiences are the ones that are going to thrive imagine a bar where we can all gather once again Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Remember gathering in bars? It seems like a lifetime ago that we gathered in places like this to celebrate. Today, it's a window for takeout. It's very painful because our staff is, they're our friends, they're family to us, and to have to lay them off and leave them high and dry without any answers. And normally I'm the person that gives them the answers. I'm the person they look to for answers, and that's just not there. These businesses are hanging on by a thread. They think they can make it. And to do that, they'll need a few things. Better communication and timelines from the government, continued support, but more than anything else, they just need the COVID cases to get under control. That would be the best stimulus any of them could hope for. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. As Ontario ICUs approach a crisis level, there's worry about who might be denied care. It's a death sentence because refusing them critical care pretty much guarantees they're not going to survive. The life and death decisions doctors will soon have to make if Ontario is forced to triage. Next.
Welcome back. Critical care doctors and nurses have been sounding the alarm about the crisis unfolding in Ontario's ICUs. With limited resources and people, the worst case scenario is that they'll have to start deciding who gets intensive care and who doesn't. Here's Terence McKenna with what we know about the protocol drawn up to guide Ontario doctors. This week, the Ontario Medical Transportation Company, Orange, has set a record for patient transfers. Moving intensive care patients out of the worst hit areas of the province, especially around Toronto taking them to regional hospitals that still have room. Some hospitals are at the breaking point. Beds full, staff exhausted. Every model shows that the situation will be getting even worse in the weeks ahead. Dr. David Nelipovitz is chief of critical care at the Ottawa Hospital. I, I think we all recognize that the numbers are going in the wrong way, so yes, it will be worsening. Ontario doctors are preparing for an emergency situation where critical care will have to be rationed. If there are just not enough intensive care beds to go around, the question becomes, who gets them and who doesn't? We looked over a number critical Care Services Ontario has provided this color-coded chart for doctors to help assess a patient's predicted short-term mortality risk, assessing their chances of dying in the next 12 months from non-COVID causes. So do they have heart disease? Do they have lung disease, kidney disease? Do they have cancer? How likely are they to survive from their other um, illnesses and, and medical problems over the next year? Patients will be scored on the seriousness of their illness. Can they dress, bathe, eat, walk, or get out of bed without assistance? Could they handle their finances or go shopping? When the existence of this triage protocol leaked out, it enraged advocates of disabled people, like Toronto lawyer David Lepofsky. The problem is that Ontario's triage protocol is rampant with disability discrimination and that is flagrantly contrary to the Human Rights Code and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's a death sentence because refusing them critical care pretty much guarantees they're not going to survive. Doctors say there are explicit protections for disabled people in the triage protocol. And my, my opinion, and for what it's worth, is that disabilities doesn't factor in as a, as a major factor to limit care. Good morning, everyone. On January 21st, Critical Care Services Ontario released this webinar featuring Dr. Nilipovitz and others explaining the triage protocol to hospital staff across the province. This um, finger painting here is a schematic of what uh, triage might look like as numbers mount. The webinar included a chart showing how patients with the least likelihood of 12-month survival would be prevented from receiving critical care as the level of rationing increased. It emphasized that at least two doctors would have to sign off on any triage decision. Making these life and death decisions will be an enormous ethical challenge for doctors. None of us want to be playing God. None of us want to limit the care of anyone. I think the idea of we want to help the most patients possible. And so is it ethical to provide treatment that won't help an individual long term? Um, with it having the potential of harming another. So you can argue it's unethical to actually provide treatment as you would be harming another patient. The triage protocol includes possibly taking a patient off a ventilator. Currently, family consent is needed for such a gut-wrenching decision. The Tabara family is facing that now. 74-year-old Suhail Tabara was a vibrant and healthy father and grandfather before he was stricken with COVID and admitted to the Ottawa Hospital Intensive Care Ward back on February 1st. Because they say he's not getting better, the doctors want to withdraw life support. His daughter Nadine strongly objects. He's able to make con eye contact, he can move his mouth as if he's trying to speak, um, and he can track you as well. Can you close your eyes, Dad? Good, now open them. <laughs> the ICU is full and the doctors are overwhelmed and I think they may be rushing to decisions like this. The hospital says this would happen even if there was no pandemic. 
But you're in there, Baba. The final decision could ultimately be made by a consent and capacity board with patients' rights representation. One of the most controversial elements of this debate concerns emergency medical technicians who work in ambulances. Sometimes those EMT paramedics make the decision to insert a breathing tube to keep a patient alive until they reach the hospital. Then, by law, that breathing tube cannot be withdrawn without consent from a patient or next of kin. They would not initiate resuscitation in certain scenarios. And in the triage protocol the webinar, there was discussion of whether ambulance attendants should be instructed not to intubate some patients. We've been warning for a year of what we call trickle-down triage. Now, when an ambulance comes to your home in a crisis, you expect them to do everything that they can. The discussion was always about doctors running the rendering decisions, uh, not EMTs in your driveway. Will you get into a situation where ambulance attendants are told, don't intubate anyone? Yeah, that, that can happen. It would be naive for us to think that triage or changes in standard of care have not already, in effect, come about. David Leposky believes that any patient facing triage should have the right to an appeal to a consent and capacity board. There should be an expeditious opportunity for the patient to have input and for a lightning fast uh, appeal process if needed. Mr. Leposky is worried that the Ontario triage protocol will be implemented on an emergency basis without further debate. And the Premier of Ontario, the Premier of any province, can't suddenly claim now, oh, we're caught, this is an emergency, we have to act quickly. They've known of this issue for upwards of a year, if not longer. And if they're not ready for it, uh, that's because of their failure to address it properly. Even the doctors who wrote the protocol say it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. 10-9 to Sunnybrook on a CTAS-1 FTT. Patient is unresponsive, GCS-3. The risk being that without a plan, the decision might be left to what they consider the crudest decision-making possible, that those who get to the hospital first will get the care until all the beds are full. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. One year after the mass tragedy in Nova Scotia, just felt like that I would never see any beauty again. The tributes and the demand for answers. Next. today from the service to remember the victims of the mass shooting in Nova Scotia. 22 names written on rocks, each one as unique as the person it symbolized. The sorrow runs deep. Those 22 victims were family, friends and neighbours. So one year on, how is the community doing? Tom Murphy went to find out. I haven't dealt with it. I mean, three of the people were my friends, and I knew some of the others, including the shooter, as acquaintances. Joy Laking, who has spent a lifetime capturing her community in watercolors, still can't quite grasp the words for what she's feeling these days. And I guess that's part of it, that I felt a couple, three of those friends, you know, were murdered alive one day and dead the next. It's, um... just hard to, hard to fathom. And it seems like your whole premise about people is shaken. Laking has spent hours painting the welcoming front doors of her community, where once they never locked them at night. Now she says, many do. For her, the world has lost some of its color. I love Nova Scotia and I love its beauty and it just felt like that I would never see any beauty again. 
and she wonders about the future of Portapic just across the river from her home and the impact for the wider community beyond. Do you lock your door now? Uh, yeah. So what are we seeing over there? Just around the point is Port Beck, okay? Tom Taggart is the area's municipal councillor, one of those people trying to move forward from the tragedy and not let it define the community. Because I've talked to a lot of those uh, folks, residents up there, the folks that sort of survived that night or woke up the next morning and, and you know, and uh, found out that their neighbours had been murdered and, and uh, they absolutely don't want that notoriety. They want uh, privacy, you know, peacefulness and privacy. That's what they want. And for some, they are moving ahead. Many of the homes owned by the victims have been sold. New families are moving into the area. For the most part, either the victims didn't have family there or, or their close friends and relatives have chosen not to return. And I can understand that. But uh, there's no hesitancy by anybody to, uh, uh, to, buy, to buy the land. The province thought it best for it to buy the shooter's property, removing a stain on a community that is desperately trying to rally. Case in point, the Portapic Hall, now under renovation in hopes of giving this area a new focal point, a new start. But looming in the future is the public inquiry into the RCMP's handling of the mass shooting. It's pretty raw yet, and the longer it goes on, the more kind of festers, you know what I mean? And as much as it's going to be diff extremely difficult for this to be drug on forever, you know, in the media, in whatever, uh, they need to get, that has to happen for closure. And then there are those who struggle to find the best way to commemorate the victims in all of this. Wayne Smith, whose stepson was killed in the rampage, built this memorial himself to assuage the grief. You can't just throw it away, right? It'll always happen. It's just like a loved one, your parents when they die. But, you know, they're more elderly, but these ones die tragically. They died before their time. They all stop. They all stop. See, he even took his hat off. See what I mean? Like, that gives him comfort, you know? You know, you can talk, like, nobody talks today, right? They're afraid to talk, right? Afraid to. But you can be emotional around this and say, well, how are you dealing with it? How am I dealing with it? And at the end of the day, that willingness by others to share the grief helps too. It has been wonderful that the whole province has felt the pain. I mean, they don't feel it quite the same way if it isn't a place that you, when you live here, it's different. And a lot of Canadians too have felt, have have shared the grief and hopefully going forward it makes us all more uh, human and caring. Tom, you spent so much time in the last year covering this story in the communities that were affected. Tell us about the, the lasting impact of this. Yeah, and you know, grief counselors are telling people, of course, always they will have to live with the loss, but that with time they'll find different ways to process the grief, and hopefully some of that happened today. But there is something else they will have to live with. It used to be that this kind of gun violence always happened somewhere else. But in speaking to some of the people in the most affected communities, there's this nagging realization that it can happen here. It did happen here. And with that comes a real loss of innocence, they say, will never leave them. Ian? Tom Murphy in Halifax tonight. Thank you. And let's hear a little more now from Melanie Doan's tribute to the victims at today's memorial. A BBC meteorologist has taken social media by storm with his second striking performance of the broadcaster's theme song on his drum kit. So Canadian Twitter got involved, encouraging CBC News meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff to do the same, and then some colleagues signed on. Things snowballed, became our moment. 
when Amy Bell, who also does weather on occasion out here in Vancouver, tagged me in the BBC drumming. And I thought, what a great chance to show the world my xylophone skills. <laughs> so I posted it and Lee, Lee and I have worked together on podcasts before out in Vancouver. And we've been trying to figure out a way to collaborate on something. Who knew that it would be a xylophone drumming rendition of the Weather State? I took inspiration from the fact that it was originally posted from the BBC drummer. I'm going to pitch it to uh, to CBC Vancouver because uh, it's it's got rhythm. I like it. I only have 10 seconds to say the drummer looks like the one in the BBC, looks like Conan O'Brien. I love the drumstick drop by Johanna and Lee, who worked here for years out in Prince Edward Island as part of that. Basically, I've got everything I need. That is the national for April 18th. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>